Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are. It's Wade T. Lightheart here with my co-founder of Bioptimizers, Matty G. Uh, I am so pumped about today. We haven't done a podcast together. We haven't done an Awesome Health podcast forever. And Almost a crime. How it, is, it is pretty much is, and we're going to actually increase these over the next while because, you know, Matt is a wealth of information. He's on the bleeding the literally the bleeding edge he does bleed literally to kind of optimize his health regularly by taking uh, a variety of blood extractions and testing a lot of different things we're going to get into that in one of the future podcasts but today we're going to go kind of back the truck up we're going to talk about something that every high performer deals with and everybody listening to this is going to deal with this and that is burnout and its relation to the nervous system. What is the relationship? Because if you're kind of into bio-optimization uh, or you know, you call yourself a biohacker or whatever, everybody gets pretty much into that area because their, their mind is writing checks that their body can't cash. Uh, and you know, part of the a high performer is to find that balance, that balance between am I performing at a high level and am I destroying my body to do that? And it was kind of cool in the 80s to do that. It's not cool as we move into 2020. It's about, I want my cake. I want to eat it too. I want to be a superhuman. And we're on the edge of the evolutionary parts of what it takes to become a superhuman. And most people want to become a superhuman because they recognize, you know, there is that angel that we're getting we're getting examples of people who are delivering at super high levels. But what is the, what is the components? What do you need to do? What are the daily practices? What are, the, what are the things to watch out for? How do you end up in the burnout? How do you destroy yourself? Matty G, what do you got to say about this right now? I've been doing all the talking. Let's see what you've got to say on this. Well, I'm going to make a bold statement, which we, which we both love to do, which is I think in terms of quality of life, understanding what we're going to be talking about today, probably the most important thing. And we're going to get into that. So there's my bold statement, the most important system in the body for quality of life. That's the topic. All right. So let's, so, so wait, let me cue you up for a second. So, sure. you know, just a little bit of background Wait, I've been friends for what, 20 years, it's been a long time. Yep. And, uh, Wade went through something a couple years ago that again, I've never seen him go through that in our relationship. And it was an incredible, you know, lesson. I mean, I always love learning from other people's mistakes and uh, Wade, you showed me again, a lot of things of what not to do. And it was really powerful. And, and, and I was thinking about that the other day and it inspired today's topic. So why don't you share what happened and the aftermath of that? And I think it'll, it's a perfect segue into the, today's uh, conversation. Yeah, great. So I'm going to talk about the deep level or the deep cost of uh, doing more than your physiological capable or and what are the general go to moves that people make on a consistent basis, rationalize, which sets them up for a deep failure. So a few years back. Um, so keep in mind, I'm kind of living the the what I would call the Tim Ferriss lifestyle the quote unquote four hour work week. Nobody actually works the four hour work week, but you know, I'm traveling around the world. I'm living where I want to live. I've got multiple online businesses and then everything is kind of, you know, going along and you kind of just assume, but what happens inside any business, there are certain components where you've got to get laser focused. You've got to adapt to new skills you got to develop new capabilities. And there's an easy assumption, especially in today's world, where we kind of, we all think that we can do multiple things, you know, 50 different things because of all the digital technology. But there's a certain point in our biology where we don't adapt to these, what I would call silicone brain and our carbon brain. Our carbon brain is the one we were born with. The silicone brain is the extension. And right now, there's a lot of input data that's coming in on the nervous system, especially if you're running businesses. And when you go up in business, there's more data coming in. And so I ran into this trouble. And so what my answer was is, well, I'll just work more. Okay. So I can remember it started, I was in Bali, Indonesia. And, uh, you know, I'm running a company that I'm, I'm in kind of startup mode over there. I've got um, one business that's kind of in steady mode. And then I've got 
by optimizers, which is going into grow, like ex extreme growth mode. And as you can imagine, those are three different stages of business that don't actually match. And so I'm doing mornings with one business partner, uh, early morning, like I'm a meeting with him doing that stuff. I'm doing my regular business, my kind of cash flow business in the afternoons. And I'm staying up till like, three, four, 30 in the morning. So I'd sleep three hours, wake up, do one business, go for a massage in the afternoon, <laughs> come back, go to work again, sleep for an hour and a half, wake up and then work the evenings. And it all looked like it would go right. So after a couple months of that, I was really starting to pay the price. And what I'm doing to, to manage that is I'm upping, I'm increasing my caffeine take, I'm increasing my nootropics, so that my brain is focused. So I, I, I feel like I'm laser. And for some things you are, and I feel like I got the energy, cause I do, but it's like paying your mortgage off with a credit card. You're, you're, you got your mortgage at 5% interest, which is manageable maybe over 30 years. And then you've got your credit card bill, which is at 19.99%. So I'm paying the 5% with the 19.99. So the, the deficit is growing. Like if you've been to New York City and you've seen that deficit sign of how much the national debt is going, that's a great example. And only you're doing this, not just with money, you're doing this with your physical energy units. And it was still kind of manageable. So I moved to Panama because I'm like, you know, I can't handle it. It's the time zone. You know, if I'm just in the one time zone. Now, keep in mind, Matt and I are living about an eight and a half minute walk from each other. Yes. And over the course of, I believe it was four and a half months, Matt and I saw each other physically five times. Okay, like, we're best friends. We're hanging out all the time. I only got time to see him. And, and, he's, and what happened is I'm, I'm, I'm still burning and I'm still going. I'm still trying to do all these things. And what happened is the unexpected happened. I had a problem in my growth business. And, and that was a, a challenge with my partner. And there was a bunch of challenges that came up. And that's the piece that takes you out. It's the unexpected where you've got to go to another level and solve problems you haven't solved. Well, guess what? That's when... I ran out of gas and literally physiologically I was burnout. Um, it didn't matter how much caffeine I was taking. It wasn't helping. It was also putting me in an unresourceful psychological state, an unresourceful emotional state. And, and, and at the very low point, uh, Matt and I went for dinner at a restaurant. He's like, Hey bro, uh, how's it going? And I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm living in hell. <laughs> and I can go back years and years before um, when I was competing and Matt could comment on this in 2003, I went through a similar process. I was running my personal training business. I was preparing for the Mr. Universe contest and I had a serious problem with the relationship. I and my relationship partner was addicted to drugs and creating a lot of havoc. And even though I broke up, I was dealing with all these other X factors that you can't plan, plan on. And that set me up for the big burnout after Mr. Universe. I was able to maintain that level for nine and a half months, but eventually the wheels came off. And it was another six, seven months before I recovered from that. And I had to get rid of some things. And so how do you handle this? The question is, and so how do you handle this? And, and for me, it involved, uh, I had to go off caffeine completely. I stopped coffee. Um, I had to stop putting hard stop times on when I was working, when I wasn't working. Uh, I had to start taking vacations. I wasn't taking vacations. You know, the, the four hour work week, it looks like you're on vacation, but you're really not, you're, you know, or that kind of digital nomad lifestyle. And, uh, and then I had to take a hard look about my own skill sets based on where the growth I wanted to experience in my own business. So how do, I, how do I become more efficient and more effective at new things? How do I let go of things that I'm not good at? How do I improve the physiological recovery components in my body, which we're going to get into here? And what are the things do I got to drop that's maybe, you know, how do I get out of the credit card paying the mortgage debt from an energy kind of standpoint. So that's where I was. I implemented a lot of new things. One of the, you know, one of the big things of getting off the caffeine, cranking magnesium uh, 
to, 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 you know, literally the toilet, the toilet experience where you're, you're watching, you know, cause that's one of the big nervous system burners, uh, essential fatty acids, things like that. So yeah, that was, that was my perspective, perspective quickly. We'll dive into a little bit more, but Matt, you want to add to that from your perspective? Cause you're on kind of the outside looking in and you know me pretty well. Yeah. You know, it was, um, first of all, I understood why you were doing what you were doing. Uh, I think there was, uh, again, a lot of, of things you could have done differently, which was pretty much what we're going to talk about today, all the different things that you can do. And just to zoom out, what we're really talking about is managing your nervous system. And we're going to say managing because I, I like it better than balancing. Balancing, what does that really mean? So um, managing your nervous system is probably one of the most important things to avoid what weight experience or to avoid the slot zone. Cause if you go to the other mode of just, and I've got friends that are stuck in that zone too, which is not good. Um, or they're just kind of re in, in relaxing for years and they're not technically retired, but anyways, it's a whole other topic, but we're really talking about managing nervous system. And when I was looking at Wade, he was cranking, cranking, cranking. Then I, for, first thing, I think the first system that went offline was probably his emotions. Um, you know, again, and we're, we're going to talk about kind of the different set of emotions in the different parts of the nervous system, but he shifted completely to fight or flight or freeze zone emotionally. And then the, the mental capacity started dropping just the, the kind of decisions you were making waiters, the way you were thinking, I'm like, you know, I know, I know you enough to know that that's not the thought you would have had prior. And um, so that was the kind of the next phase. And then you kind of, like you described, you went to hell. And then just to make this more real on the numbers level, I, I have this neurofeedback system at home and I wired Wade, Wade's brain to it. And the amount of electricity in Wade's brain at that moment was about a quarter of my friend who's 76 years old. Like, like he is, you know, we're not going to say he was brain dead, but it wasn't far away on an electrical level, literally. Um, and, and for those of you that don't understand that, that, that's a lot of your, your states and your mind and how you think come from electrical energy. So Wade had literally like just burnt out the electrical energy in his brain plus his body. And, you know, wait, it took you what, like a year to bounce back from that, you know, like, like on all levels, like you, you kind of were coming and I, I was, I was seeing you come back online again, first uh, your, your executive functioning, your brain, and then your emotions. But yeah, it took you about a year. Is that right? Yeah, it, uh, I would say, yeah, probably a good year. Yeah, it was about, it was about 12 months to recovery. And, and going back, say, when I had my other burnout in 2003, that was a six month recovery period. It was actually, actually, if I look all told, it would be nine months because there was the, the three months of catastrophic rebound where I gained all the weight and, that's, and things like that, which is usually a sign of adrenal fatigue start just putting on weight and can't get it off. That's a, that's a good indication that you're, you're tracking in the wrong direction. It's kind of like the fat cat businessman image that we all have in our minds. And, um, and so this time it was about a year. So you're looking at, if you look at the age difference, there was an extra three months of recovery, even though I had way more tools than I had back then. So you're probably looking at a, a two X factor just with the age um, and my rationalization for it, now I want to be quick about before we get into the mechanics, the rationalization was, is it is, you know, my mentality is just go in and take on as much as you can until you blow. And when you blow, you get really laser clear with kind of painful realities of what's working and what's not working. I'm not recommending that strategy. It's a strategy that I've done to make quantum jumps. And I feel I made that quantum jump now, but you can avoid that. Uh, you can avoid that. Matt, have you, what's, your, what's your comments on that as far as how you kind of look at it? Because you're kind of a, a hyper growth oriented person and as far as burnouts in your own life of what you've had and, what you, and why you've kind of accurated the, the, the way that you approach things now. Yeah, I think um, I only really hit one burnout, which was in my 20s. There was a lot of like micro things. So but in my 20s, I decided to do a crazy experiment of sleep deprivation and workaholism to the max. So I got up to, I was doing 80 hours a week in the gym, like literally 80 hours in the gym working. I was a trainer. 
plus I was training twice a day, plus I was recording a hard rock album, plus I was learning marketing. So I was doing all these things at a time and I'm like, okay, well, I need to sleep less. How old were you at this time? Um, I was 25. If I would have done that later, it would have probably had much more severe consequences. So I'm like, okay, I need to sleep less. So let me start cutting my sleep back by 15 minutes, like every week or so. So I started, you know, like seven hours and six and a quarter, six and a half and five. And then, I, you know, and then it got to the point when it was a really interesting thing. I think around the five hour mark, like I had to drink water nonstop to stay awake. Like if, if I, if I got even like 1% dehydrated, I would just crash. The other thing too is like, you, you, you get so sensitive with food, like certain foods would make me crash instantly. So, you know, that was kind of interesting experiment because every little thing would either just throw me off or keep me going. But I, I just crashed and burned out, I think around four hours and 25 minutes or 15 minutes, uh, four, four and a quarter is when uh, I ended the experiment and declared it unsuccessful and then read a book called Power Sleep and went the other way. And it took me, it took it, I think it took me like four months. And by the way, I wasn't using caffeine, thank God. But um, I hadn't discovered caffeine at that point. It took me, I think, four months of sleeping around 10 hours a day to, to recover from that. And then, then my sleep kind of normalized, but that was it. So since that time, you know, I've become very, very hyper aware of, okay, you know, there's all these signs that I look for, including, um, you know, my executive functioning starts dropping. In other words, my capacity, how I feel, I'm, I'm not enjoying work as much. And that's a classic sign too, from like overtraining, even in the gym, like you're training really hard and you just, it starts to feel like a chore. That's a sign typically that, okay, time to back off. Um, so I got all these different signals. Plus I use like the aura ring so I can see my HRV and my heart rate. So, you know, that starts getting out of whack. I know my nervous system is stressed. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a second, but yeah. So, so my strategy now, and, and, you know, it, it, we'll talk about how to change this permanently too. Cause I used to kind of hit a red line, maybe three, four times a year. Now, okay. I got to go on vacation versus now, I can't remember the last time I hit it. It's probably been like a year and a half, two years now. Like there's still like a yellow zone on the, R, on the RPMs that, I, that I'll hit, you know, a couple of times, but I don't tend to get red and like I used to. And, and a lot of it's because of the stuff we're going to talk about. So I just want to zoom out and, and, and break down what we're talking about. So we're talking about the nervous system, which divides into two. So you have the parasympathetic system, which we're going to call the healing system of the body. Okay. And it's a very accurate description because all the healing happens in that zone as far as your body's concerned. Then there's the sympathetic nervous part of the, the nervous system, which is fight, flight, or freeze. So let's just go back to the caveman days and there's a cyber saber tooth tiger chasing you. You need to activate your, fight, flight, or freeze system. Hopefully fight or flight kicks in because if you freeze, you're dead. Um, but either you're running really fast or you're going to fight this threat. And that's a huge part of you know, survival, right? And, and really it's kept us alive. And if it wasn't for that, probably uh, there'd be no humans. Yeah, so evolutionary really biology. These, these, are, these are things that are built over millions of years in your nervous system that are intrinsic with being a human. It really intrinsic with being an animal. You can see Correct. that in a dog, a cat, like, you know, th these are all part of the animal brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, we're talking- Even bacteria will recoil against a, a toxic substance, right? It's flighting Correct. from it. You know, you take a single cell organism with mercury and it recoils. So it's built right into every cellular system that we yeah, see it's today. It's kept us alive. So, so just for the purpose of this podcast, we're going to talk about the healing system and what is called the fight or flight system. Um, so, you know, again, when there's a threat, just to go one level deeper here, when there's a threat, there is, again, three potential responses, which is, you know, I'm going to fight this thing, I'm going to run away from this thing, or I'm going to freeze like a deer in the headlights, which is probably the worst option. So that's, again, the fight or flight. So let's go through different things in different parts of the body, and we're going to kind of uh, organize them in different categories. And by the way, there's a, P a one page PDF that you can look at 
that'll show you this is bioptimizers.com slash nervous system. And you'll be able to see what I'm about to walk us through. So let's start with exercise and exercise is primarily fight or flight. So when you're lifting weights, that's a fight or flight response. You're playing sports. It's a fight or flight response. Even things like running. I mean, you're literally like it's flight, right? Like you're running. Now on the healing side, there are some exercises and two that come to mind is, is Tai Chi and yoga. So Tai Chi is this really slow type of, of movement that again, with the breathing and just this slow movement activates your parasympathetic, uh, again, your healing part of your nervous system. So I, I haven't done Tai Chi. I've done a lot of yoga and yoga is really interesting because it's really, you know, it kind of physically intense, but because you're breathing and really slowing down the breath and breath is a huge part of managing your nervous system. And wait, I want you to talk about your breathing techniques uh, in, a, in a minute because you've done a lot of that. But when you're breathing deep and slowly, that activates the healing part of the nervous system. If I start <sighs> hyperventilating, that activates my fight or flight response. And that's what happens when you're fight or flight, you know, you start hyperventilating because you're trying to get more oxygen to the brain. So anyways, Wade, maybe talk about the breathing stuff and we'll get into meditation in a second, but uh, I know you've done a little bit of yoga and I know that you, you do a lot of breathing exercises almost every day. So maybe talk about the breath and how you use it to change your nervous system. Yeah, great, great point. So, and I will make one caveat in regards to yoga. Some of the newer forms of yoga are what I would say more into the fight or flight stuff. So when you get into the stuff like the power yogas and things like that, which are outside of maybe the classical styles that were cultivated in India, because, you know, yoga has got all these branches are now moving more to an exercise format. And those I'm, I'm not saying I'm not discounting that they're valuable as an exercise point, but they will not give you that parasympathetic response the same way. So let's talk about healing um, with the breath work. So I've been doing breath work literally for the last 20 years and through meditation. And you learn a lot of different things about breath work. So the breathing is, and we talk about this in the Awesome Health course, if you haven't downloaded or got involved with the Awesome Health course, we, we actually go really, really deep on this where I can share with you exactly how you do these things. But breathing is the only thing that you do both consciously and unconsciously. In other words, you can think about your breathing and change its rate, either faster or slower, or it happens unconsciously. And for most people, it's unconscious. Uh, you don't ever think about it, it just happens. Unless, of course, you're underwater and suddenly here without it, then it's like, uh oh. Um, so what was discovered uh, in ancient forms of, of practice, and we're going back at least 6,000 years, maybe even beyond that, is that you could change your brain state, your focus ability, and now that's all been proven through science. It was kind of a lot of a thought of airy fairy ideas by these kind of mystical people that you know wore funny beards and roads and stuff well it actually has now been proven by science thank you to the dalai lama who i think brought a lot of advanced uh breath work people or meditators to the world of science so that we could actually track and see how their brains look and their brains look very different than the ordinary person and one of the ways they do this is by practicing breathing so there's a couple things to do. Now, what's interesting in Eastern philosophy, the exhale is the start of the breath. And what the exhale process does is it takes carbon out of the system. And by decarbonating the blood is actually what creates the healing component. The oxygen component will come on by itself, but by starting with the exhale, a conscious exhale, then when the oxygen comes in, then you're going to load up your hemoglobin a lot more, carry more oxygen. And if you carry more oxygen inside the cell without uh, a, like a, a rapid kind of breathing, that's what switches you over into the healing side of the nervous system of the parasympathetic. So all breathing practice would start out with maybe some short, quick breaths, like, and then a slow or even a double in here we go. And, and take a short and then a slow so that you actually start to train your body to take a deeper breath into the lower part of the lungs. Because most people when you're sitting, you're getting about 30% of the oxygen inside your body. The other piece that you need to learn to 
which is counter to my bodybuilding world, is to learn how to belly breathe. So fortunately, when I was a kid, um, I had a world-class music teacher and they taught us how to belly breathe. And belly breathing is where you actually let your belly come out even while you're sitting. And what that does is that opens up your lungs so that you can get fuller, deeper breaths. Now in bodybuilding, which I learned years later, is you're always trying to keep your stomach in. So you think about a bodybuilder, oh, you know, which way to the beach, right? Because he's holding that in. So practicing learning to let your belly relax on the inhale, as opposed to inhaling through the chest, which is what most people think they do. They're, it's got th- you know, it's kind of like this way, as opposed to slower down deeper inside your body and even the top musical people if you go to roger loves uh course i think he's the best speaking uh coach in the world he spends a lot of time on teaching you how to breathe that's how the best musicians make the best sounds and get that deep resonant voice that you hear through singing is how you belly breathe and so what i do i start every day i do uh, some quick exhales Right, I do some quick exhales and then I do slow, long, long and slow inhales. I'll, I'll start off with a process I call it the 10, 10, 10, 10 program, which is 10 seconds in, tech, 10 seconds hold, 10 seconds exhale, 10 seconds with no breath. Now, when you start that out, you're probably only going to do maybe three or four seconds. And what's interesting is you'll start to realize is that you don't have the lung capacity. You, it feels like you don't have the lung capacity to hold your breath, particularly in the exhale, more, more than three or four seconds. And there's a panic part, which indicates that you're in sympathetic nervous system. As you go through this, and sometimes it's called box breathing, you know, it's with your, each breath is the same amount. By doing that, imagine a four-sided breath that the, you know, your exhale, and then your inhale, and then your hold, and then your exhale and and leave each one of those are the sides of a box, okay? Those, if you're doing five seconds or 10 seconds or however long, those are going to indicate how quickly you get into sympathetic. And usually once you get over that between five and 10 seconds, if you can get into that range, you're going to be moving into sympathetic nervous system or excuse me, parasympathetic nervous, out of sympathetic into parasympathetic. So out of fight or flight into healing. And think about this when you're in a stressful situation. Let's say something's coming up or you're gonna go on stage to speak or you've got a fight coming up or something stressful is coming in. What do people naturally do? They go, <sighs> you know, that you, you instantly do this. And so what you're doing is consciously leveraging that response, slowing it down so you don't go into that adrenal fight or flight mode. And I'll, one last piece before we kick it over to Matt is there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. And there's various techniques where you start actually working and feeling the energy revolve inside your system. And that's what people are talking about, chi or prana. And as you deeply meditate, you actually get to feel these systems that aren't available to us. But when I was in the middle of my fight or flight craziness was literally the first time in 20 years that I wasn't able to do my meditations. I literally couldn't do my meditations because I wasn't able to escape the fight or flight mode. It was so ingrainedly deep. And that was, of course, uh, extremely painful. At Bioptimizers, our mission is to fix digestion. And a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3OM provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. So there's also, first of all, there's a lot of different breathing techniques and what we just yeah. is great. And that's got a lot of benefits to uh, clearing out CO2 and, and different things. Um, I got wired 
to a medical grade breathing HRV machine. So let me just talk about heart rate variability for a second because it's probably the most useful number to manage your nervous system. Your, H, your heart rate variability, HRV, is the best indicator to see where you're at and which direction you're going in. So what that means, it's actually the time in between the heart beats. And going back to breathing, when you inhale, you will typically see a shortening of the time. And then when you're exhaling, then it, it goes a little longer. Now, if you're stressed out, there is no, there is very little variability. That means the heartbeat is like kind of like a piston. Now you might be thinking, is that a good thing? No, it's not. It means your body's stressed versus if I'm breathing and, and I'll talk about the kind of the, the metric breathing naturally, I'll just call it. Uh, I should see massive variability, which by the way, one, a couple of tools to measure that one is the aura ring, which I have one right here. That kind of gives me my score for the night. I can see kind of a graph of what happens to my heart rate variability. Um, and another one, which is more of a real time is called the buyer strap. So we'll put a link um, in, in the, again, boptimizers.com slash nervous system. So you can see the, the links and, and, and perhaps invest in those. Quick, things. quick, quick question. Which do you prefer um, for what reason, the bio strap versus the aura ring? I think that's a good <laughs> distinction. So I, I like, to go. I like the aura ring for, for measuring how fried my nervous system is in the morning. I think it, I think it's got a better set of metrics and algorithms, but the buyer strap, um, let's say I want to do something and just see what my HRV is, or again, it's not just HRV. It's got a bunch of metrics. I can't do that with the aura ring. So the buyer strap for like more real time, like let's say you want to do an experiment, see, Hey, how did that affect my HRV? Literally in two minutes, you push a button and two minutes later, you get a score. So I, I like both of them. Um, I use them for, for different things, but that's a, that's a good question. So anyways, HRV is the most important thing. Going back to this machine that I got wired to, the way it works is you, you do these different breathing times. And again, it's not a box breath. It's you know either four seconds, usually starts four seconds in, four seconds out, five seconds in, five seconds out. Like you follow this, this system. And then it tells you exactly what your optimal breathing pace is to maximize HRV. In other words, to relax your body. And for me, for an example, it was like six and a half seconds. So in other words, if I just breathe like, again, no, no holding and no pressure, no pushing. Cause it was interesting if I, if I kind of like, cause I did, I've done a lot of, a lot of yoga and yoga, you do like, you kind of like, you know, kind of squeeze your throat a little bit to push the breath out a little slower. If I did that, it would actually stress out my nervous system a little bit. So Again, it's a lot of different breathing techniques. I'm just sharing this one. So for most people, it's like five, six seconds, just in, out, um, no, nothing forced, big belly breath, like Wade said, those, those things work. So anyways, that, that, that I think covers exercise. There's a lot of other stuff to talk about, but this is a great segue into brain waves. So both Wade and I have done several rounds of medical wiring level neurofeedback. So what is neurofeedback? It is a brain measuring feedback system. You get these electrodes wired to your brain and they feed back to you what's happening. So if you're doing the right thing, you get a, a reward in the form of these beautiful audio tones. And if you're doing the wrong thing and go silent, so your brain's like, whoa, that didn't work. Let me try something else. And when you're doing the right thing, you're like, oh, okay, that's what I need to do. Let me do more of that. So think of it kind of as a GPS. If you're driving around and you, you head on on the wrong street, the GPS says they turn around. Um, that's basically how it is, but you're training your brain to hit all these different states. So there is five major groups of brain waves, and there's three of them that are in the healing side and two are more on the fight or flight side. So on the healing side, you have alpha, which is relaxed but alert. And, and that's a great kind of first goal for meditators is to reach that state. Um, then if you slow your brain waves down even more to like four to seven hertz, then you hit theta, which is a lot slower and a much deeper state. And then if you slow it down even more, which is what we hit when we sleep, 
also is about zero to four hertz, that's delta. So if you think about how much healing, like all the healing in your body pretty much happens when you're in delta deep sleep, most of it, right? Your growth hormone, your testosterone, all your hormones get produced in that phase. Again, going back to that's the healing side. Now on the fight or flight side, you have beta. So right now, Wade and I are in beta, we're engaged, we're focused, we're thinking. And you know, if, if beta goes too high in the wrong places of the brain, that's what anxiety looks like. That's what happens. Mm-hmm. It's like your brain has too many uh, of these beta brain waves. And, you know, we all know people like that. They're kind of stuck in that mode. You know, the way I would describe these people is they sleep. They, you know, that's the only time they're in parasympathetic. The only time they're in healing is they fall asleep. And most of them, actually, if you have a lot of beta, usually it's bad sleep, which is a whole other topic. And then they wake up, they go right to beta, have a cup of coffee, go, you know, mm-hmm. and then they, they fall asleep at night and then they repeat that cycle and they, they, they're kind of can, stuck in those two zones. Can, can you talk about, because I see this happening so much more with the role of digital devices now and you can talk about blue light or stimulus and, and all that sort of stuff, which is, you know, Dr. Cruz talks a lot about this stuff. What, what, what's your take on all that? And Mm-hmm. And, and, and the role of technology of keeping us locked into beta and also maybe people not getting out into nature. Yeah, that's, um, let me just finish the fight or flight on the brainwaves and we'll, we'll segue right into that because it's a, it's a perfect uh, segue. So the last wave I'll put in fight or flight is gamma, which gamma is an incredibly high spiritual state. Like you, you just kind of have this universal connection with, higher power. I would say it that way. And one of our mutual friends, um, we'll name his name just to protect his anonymity, but he has the highest gamma that's ever been recorded at one of these brain uh, wave facilities. And, you know, it fries him. I mean, it's a very, very intense brain wave. I mean, it's very intense. It's, it's, it's very powerful. It's incredible spiritual, but there is a cost to it. So, so that's why I kind of put in fight or flight. Anyways, um, you kind of see a lot of psychics and stuff in that zone, I would think. Or they kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of like the wizard on the movie that pulls off the magic spell and then they're kind of wiped out on the side. It's kind of like. Well, all right. So just to be completely unfiltered, um, one of our main spiritual mentors, David Hawkins, and there's a lot of stories like this. They kind of have these massive spiritual jumps. Now, in my opinion, what's happening physiologically based on what we currently know is they they have this massive, massive gamma break burst, like a gamma burst on Star Trek. They're they're just like, (laughs) they're just in gamma all the time. And what we know with these experiences is that it takes them years in order to learn how to live with that, learn how to manage that. And for Derek Hawkins took him about seven years. Um, Eckhart Tolle, three years. And I mean, it is all kinds Ramana of- Ramana Maharishi didn't talk for years. You can look through the histories of these kind of advanced mystics who have flowed, and most of them go through this period where they're just, they're just not functional in the world at all. And I, and I think a lot of it is learning to, to function with gamma, learning, you know, having the nervous system respond and adapt. So that's it. But it's back to your question. Um, first of all, technology is, so let's, let's segue to neurotransmitters and then we'll segue into your question because the neurotransmitters are, are the explanation to your question. Correct. So on the healing side, we have four main tra- neurotransmitters. We have serotonin, which gets released when you eat sugar. That's one of the reasons people eat a lot of sugar because it makes them feel a little more relaxed. We have endorphins, which, you know, if you go to the gym, it's kind of the reward you get afterwards. Running, um, long yeah. distance biking, yep. endorphin highs. Yep. We have oxytocin, which is kind of the, the love molecule. When you first start dating someone, first 12 months, there's a huge or, or when a woman gives birth to a baby through the birth canal is the biggest boost of oxytocin there is, I think. Right. And also, that's why women love cuddling after sex, because there's a big oxytocin release. And then there's anandamide which is the bliss molecule. So all four of those are more, and bliss potentially is even fight or flight, but those are on the healing side. And then on the fight or flight side, we have adrenaline, noradrenaline, and dopamine. So if we look at technology and, you know, all the phones and all the apps, they are, they are hijacking our dopamine system. 
So every time you get notifications, that's activating dopamine. Your brain feels like, whoa, hey, I'm a little bit important. Somebody's reaching out. Somebody liked something. Somebody messaged me. And when people are messaging you and commenting on your stuff or liking your stuff, that is releasing dopamine every single time. So most of us, and I'm not immune to this, we're all trapped in these dopamine loops to various levels. And you know, there's a lot of things we can do to manage that. Um, and some people, again, are, are really completely lost in it. Now, blue light is, is actually more fight or flight. We know this because it's designed to wake us up, right? When the sun would hit our eyes, it's like go time versus, you know, other colors of light like orange and the reds are more relaxation. And, you know, and for those of us that wear blue light blocking glasses, we know that our brain starts just shutting down and, and down regulating. So that's the price on your nervous system of using these devices in a perfect world, probably about three hours, four hours before bed, you just, you just get off the, the, the phones and the iPads. The other thing too TVs. is that, uh, sorry, TVs, TVs. I mean, although TV watching TV is an alpha, it actually increases alpha. That's why a lot of people like watching TV. I like watching TV. For me, it's a good segue. Now, the light is a different story, which I can hack with glasses. Now, it obviously depends what I'm watching. If I'm watching horror movies and you know, Rambo and Commando and whoever shoot people. <laughs> that's more dopamine, right? That's gonna, uh -huh. so, so what you're watching is going to influence your neurotransmitters. Correct. But I, I like wearing uh, glasses a couple of hours before bed, and, and that will, again, tell my brain, to, hey, it's nighttime, let me shut things down. But there's also the effects of wireless waves, so Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and what it seems to be doing is increasing dopamine. So even, even just the, the, the waves that are blasting us nonstop, right, if I pull up my phone, it's probably... 15 Wi-Fi's that I can catch with my phone. So, and, and there's all kinds that I'm not seeing, right? Um, so those waves seem to be increasing dopamine. So we have the, the dopamine from the apps, the dopamine from the blue light and the dopamine from all these signals. So it's not any, it, it's no mystery that people are being hijacked from this stuff. Yeah, powerful information. Okay, so here's the stressors. How do we get it? So how, what are some physical indications that you've seen? If you can maybe walk me through some stages that people might notice when they're becoming overstimulated uh, and, 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 and headed to run down, what would you say from your observation? Cause you know, you've, you've dealt with a lot of high performers, you've coached a lot of high performers and you, you're, you're pretty much surrounded by high performers all your life. What do you, what have you noticed that they've given you feedback as well? So, well, one of the big X factors of whether you burn out or not is resilience. So we could do a whole podcast on resilience because it's a really interesting thing. Um, and resilience is primarily an emo It's more of a limbic system thing. Now, there's a physical component to resilience. How tough are you? And, you know, for example, Wade, you know, you, you're as tough physically as, as anyone else that I know. But, you know, one of the things that I've done um, – to, to like probably increase my resilience, I'm gonna say like 500%, maybe more in the last four years, has been the neurofeedback, but, but more specifically, um, cleaning out my limbic system. So you have all these traumas. When you say When you say limbic system for our listeners, what, what do you mean by the limbic system? Okay, so the limbic system is one of the components of our nervous system, okay? So it's kind of a subcomponent of it. And that's where all of our emotions, so the emotional part of our nervous system is the limbic system. We'll just call it the emotional system. So we have this emotional system. And when we see things that are similar to other painful experiences that we've had in the past, and if these painful experiences are not healed. Okay. Heal is the key word. If they're not healed, we will feel threatened by that experience. Or by something that, similar to that experience. For exactly. Example. Whatever this, this thing that's in front of me, that's reminding me of that thing that was painful. I go right to fight or flight, right? Right to fight, flight or freeze. I mean, it's immediate because and, and a great example, and we all know people that have been bitten by dogs. 
and you know, they're 40, 50, 60 years old, they'll still be scared of that, of that dog, even if it's like a small little dog. Yeah, dog comes into the elevator, their sweat perspiration comes up, their, their tension comes up, the heartbeat, adrenaline response. If you were to look at that, it's pretty significant. Or someone that's yeah. been in a car accident, they get in the car again and all of a sudden they start having a physiological response. Yeah, and it's very true even on micro levels. So for an example, you know, your mother told you, uh, you know, your grades aren't good enough. You know, so like one of the things my dad told me like one time, and I, I hit like 96 and he's like, where's the other four? And that was something I had to, to identify and heal because it was kind of driving the perfectionism in me. And anyways, so, so there's a whole a cascade of consequences that can literally lead to character defects and sometimes character assets. Uh, and I love Joe Dispenza's models on that. But going back to healing, one of the things that works incredibly well is EFT. So EFT immediately starts shifting your nervous system into parasympathetic. It's a very, very fast response because you're hitting these nine okay. points. EFT so it, stands for emotional freedom technique, by the way. Correct. And, and it's, it's probably more commonly known now as tapping. So you have these points. You have, and if you're watching the video, you have this karate chop point, top of the head, top of the eye, side, below the eye, below the nose, below the lips, right where the crease of the chin is, collarbone, and then ribs. And when you tap these points, your, your nervous system literally shifts over which, so if, so if I bring up, and, and I've like guided, I'm actually certified, I've guided you know, people countless times to do this. And I've never seen it not work. And I'm talking about like bringing up really painful experiences and shifting from, oh, wow, that was a really traumatic experience to I'm at peace with it. I mean, big ones might take 15 minutes, but usually it's like five minutes. And for me, because I've done it so much, um, it's probably like 60 seconds, two minutes sometimes. So it's a really good uh, thing. Probably one of the best sites to learn is uh, www.eftuniverse.com or you can go to YouTube. There's countless videos. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing you can do is neural feedback, which again, we talked about. So we don't really have time to talk about that. It'd be a whole other podcast. Um, you know, meditation is definitely parasympathetic. And, and, you know, especially again, if you hit, as soon as you hit alpha, you're in healing mode. So alpha, theta, delta, you hit, start hitting these slower brain waves. And that's, again, the people that are stuck in beta all the time, if they could just learn to shift their brain waves over to a slower mode, they're going to start healing. Um, so things you can do when you meditate that are highly effective. And again, th these are different emotions that are parasympathetic, that are healing. One of them is gratitude, which is this at this point is extremely highly researched. Um, if you're actually feeling gratitude, you're in parasympathetic. You are in healing mode. You, you cannot, and I'm not talking about saying thank you verbally. I'm, I'm talking about feeling gratitude in your heart, in your body. If you're feeling that sensation, you are definitely in healing mode. There's no two ways about it. There's a lot of new techniques that people are talking about is starting the day by Mm -hmm. you know, doing a gratitude list or sharing a gratitude list or what you're grateful for or getting this as a practical implementation. Because a lot of people don't really feel gratitude, you know, in, in the world today, even though as humans listening to this podcast, we're in the top 1% of humans in history of the planet. Most people are focusing on what they don't have as opposed to what they are. And that that's the comparison problem is, is, is real and present and bring yourself back to that gratitude practice is, is, is a great is a great thing. Yeah. Um, happiness in general. So, we, you know, if you're feeling happy, you're probably in parasympathetic joy, which you can kind of measure with laughter, which is one of the things I kind of pay attention to is like, how much am I laughing? And if I, if I'm not laughing, I'm probably in fight or flight. Like, you know what I mean? If I'm laughing a lot that I know I'm in a good space as far as my nervous system goes. And if I notice like I haven't, I'm not really laughing. You know what I mean? Uh, and it's one of the things I look for in people too. Are they laughing a lot? Or are they not laughing? And I can kind of gauge where they're at. Um, feeling, you know, peace, serenity. Obviously, if you're feeling peace and serenity, serenity now, as they said in Seinfeld, then yeah, you're in parasympathetic versus, you know, fear, anger. Obviously, those are total fight or flight or freeze emotions. 
and then even drive, like, you know, getting stuff done. Like, wait, you burnt, you, you weren't burning yourself out necessarily with fear and anger. For you, it was drive, that, that intense willingness. So, it, you know, and I spend probably like eight hours of my day, sometimes 10, sometimes 12 in that zone. And it's just something to be mindful of is that, yeah, when we're driving hard on our projects or business or jobs or careers, that, you know, that is fight or flight. Like, and it's a low level or fight or flight. I mean, and sometimes it's high level if you're really dealing with a lot of stress, which goes back to resilience. But, you know, driving this is a fight or flight thing. So any, any comments on that way? Because again, that's really what took you out. Yeah, I think um, there's also part of the representation of it comes down to what is valued in your own life and, and not understanding the recovery to drive ratio and how the, the harder you drive, the more do you need to manage your recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a great book, uh, The Powerful Engagement, uh, which really breaks this down about the difference. It started off with tennis players. And even though they all had relatively the same level of skills, the guys that were doing these micro rests were actually dominating the tennis field. And it was an unconscious practice, which had all kinds of applications in the business world. And one of the things that I think you were really clear about um, is your commitment to both micro and macro recovery. And you kind of went into that earlier because you probably hit that burnout zone in your 20s and said okay I, I, I you know we talked about how you that became kind of like a uh an, a, a breakthrough attention unit and for people who are listening to this podcast that's what our whole point here is to create a breakthrough awareness level that the harder you want to drive the more you need to focus on recovery mm -hmm. and and micro recovery and macro recovery as well as com com recovery components it's like a race car an f1 formula car if you think about it is going around the track at 200 miles an hour and guess what it needs to be fueled up a lot more than your regular car it's burning through tires at a lot more than a regular car um, so if you want to drive at 200 miles an hour in your life you better have a pit crew and you better be putting all the high components or recovery components or you're going into the wall and you're going to crash and burn so we're, we're, we're about at the end of the, of the show. So I just want to start talking about, you know, supplements and, and different things that shift our nervous system. Let's start with the, the easy one, the fight or flight stuff. Um, coffee, you know, any type of stimulant, you know, even THC, you know, nicotine. I mean, all of those are, you know, we'll put cocaine and have amphetamines. You know, all of that stuff is, is fight or flight or freeze, right? Mm -hmm. so any amphetamine. What, what, what's your opinion on uh, all the kind of uh, cognitive enhancers that you see people using in the digital world and also in uh, um, education universities like Ivy League schools and stuff? What, what would you classify those in? And we're, we're, we well, most of them are fight or flight. Um, yeah, the modafinils and... Which see, like modafinil is probably like a two out of 10 because there's a scale, right? Like not everything mm -hmm. is just 10s. Let's just talk about that because I think that's a lot of people are using these things. I mean, like, I talk about the guys on Wall Street are now on cocaine, testosterone, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and Adderall, you know? Or, right. And, and you know, see, testosterone is more of a fight or flight versus estrogen is more healing. So, you know, the point is that, yeah, like Adderall is probably like a seven or eight. Modafinil is probably like a two. On that, on that fight or flight scale. So there is, you know, again, scales, but yeah, almost all the nootropics. Now there are some exceptions. So let's shift the over. drug, the drug based nootropics. Yeah. But even, yeah, even some of the cleaner stuff. So if we shift over to, and so the better blends are a combination of both. So for an example, L-theanine is parasympathetic, parasympathetic healing, which counterbalances a lot of the caffeine issues. So you can stack parasympathetic substances with stimulants and have a much more balanced nervous system response versus just going completely fight or flight. So that is a great tip for everybody. But just to cover some substances, we got reishi. I would probably rate it a pretty low on healing, but it, you do feel a little bit of a shift. L-theanine, one of my favorites, I take about 400 milligrams before bed every night. CBD, CBN, CBG, those are three different cannabinoids. They are definitely on the parasympathetic side versus THC, more fight or flight. Lavender oil, one of the only uh, oils researched to show to increase alpha brain waves, which is healing. 
I, I like taking uh, actually oral lavender oil before bed. Ashwagandha, I, I took like two grams last night. I was a little wired um, during the day, shifted me right over and, and had a, a decent sleep. But the one I want to talk about, and, and we'll do a whole podcast on this uh, because we're going to run out of time, but it's magnesium. And both Wade and I uh, healed ourselves, healed our nervous system using magnesium. Like I got to the point because I was, uh, you know, squeezing my drones too much and my nervous system was literally getting raw. You can burn the myelin sheet off your nerves mm-hmm. and I couldn't drink coffee anymore. Like if I drank coffee, I would, I instantly felt like frazzled. I didn't get to, to the level Wade got, but I'm like, okay, I can't drink coffee anymore. I'm done. So I did a big magnesium cycle for around, I think 90 days and around the 60 day mark, I'm like, I felt completely different. I felt kind of permanently relaxed. So magnesium is kind of the the parasympathetic mineral. You know, nothing shifts you over on a mineral level or macro. Probably the greatest deficiency out there in North Americans right now is magnesium. I think I think it's only 32% of the population is getting the RDA levels, and that's not what the optimal level is. Yeah, because so it's there's- really hard to get from food. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. It's, it's almost impossible to eat enough magnesium. Correct. Like, like it's, that's, that's the fundamental challenge. So even if you're, you know, one of these, Hey, let me try to get the perfect diet going. Um, it's, it's really challenging to do that. So that is the list of um, parasympathetic and, and sympathetic. Like I said, go to boptimizer.com slash nervous system. I've got this entire doc, including a couple of things we didn't have a time to cover well, and you, you well, Adam, and add, throw in a couple things. So we'll sure, go a little bit longer. We, we, what what else can we do? Because I know you've gone, you spent years in testing literally hundreds of substances. So so unload on us a little bit and give us a little extra bonus. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about my favorite favorite thing, like which so this is a biohacking thing. It's not a substance, but it does relate to magnesium. The number one thing for me, like by a long shot, and I've talked to a lot of our guys, including Joe Rogan's a huge fan, is floating. So floating is a sensory deprivation tank. You're literally floating in this salt, magnesium salt soup. It's made with Epsom salts, which is a magnesium salt. And you're floating. The water is the same temperature as your body. It's pitch black. So all your senses get a reset. Like you're not getting stimuli like you normally would. Like even if I'm sitting in this chair, I'm feeling gravity right now, right? Like my feet are feeling gravity from the floor. My butt's feeling gravity from the chair. But when you're floating, you're kind of just not feeling anything. You're just, you're not really feeling the water. You don't have light, again, stimulating your brain. It's really usually completely pitch. You know, there's no sound. And you're absorbing magnesium. So I love to float for like 90 minutes. And I mean, the level of shift, like I've, I've gone places. I remember we went in LA. I flew in. A, a crash is in Venice Beach, right? Yeah, fl- yeah, Crash got the best tanks. That's the one he makes, Joe Rogan's tanks. Um, float Labs is uh, his company. Yeah. So I flew into LA. I could tell like my, my, you know, when I get fried, I get these swollen glands here, right, the lymph nodes. So I could, I was fried and I said, Hey, wait, let's go float. So Wayne and I went floating and after the float, all my, you know, all my glands were, were back to normal and I felt incredible. So there's one thing I recommend is definitely floating, um, to, to shift over your uh, nervous system. Chiropractic too. Uh, I have a world-class chiropractor, which I'm actually going to go see here in about an hour and a half. Um, is also a way that you're able to take relief off the nervous system. If you have a really good chiropractor, of course, uh, I've got what we call the wizard here in Vancouver. There's uh, Gary down in LA, that his, his whole thing at the Human Garage, they've got some really great things to switch you into that healing mode. And a, and a really good chiropractor will be able to take load off the nervous system. And one of the things that I didn't have on those travels is I didn't have my chiropractor who was always giving me that feedback uh, of where I was. And one of the big recovery modalities that I've experienced is by using chiropractic care. I will close off with a shameless pitch. We have a new product called Magnesium Breakthrough, which is seven different magnesiums, including cofactors. In our humble uh, opinions, it is the best magnesium out there. So what we recommend you do if you're feeling a little fried, a little bit in the fight or flight system is to take around 
three doses a day. It is better to spread your dose because if you take too much magnesium at once, you may uh, run to the bathroom because it, it, it can be your pain. But however, key powerful note, we formulated this to minimize that effect. So when we, when we formulated this, because because different mag some magnesiums pull a lot more water than others, um, we minimize the, the water pulling effect. So we recommend starting off with probably half a gram three times a day and then building up to three grams. So it'd be a gram three times a day. That's probably a good dose. Um, I mean, if you really want to push it, you can try to get to like four or five, six grams. That's, that's where I ended up uh, when I was really healing. I think I got to five grams um, and felt incredible. So anyways, that is our new product, uh, magnesiumbreakthrough.com. You can go on our site, bioptimizer.com and check it out. It's an amazing product. We're really excited to share this because we know both Wade and I have experienced the, the healing benefits of magnesium. Um, it, it's it's incredible. It's literally one of the best supplements that I've ever experienced in terms of real world experiential benefits. And that's why we wanted to, to do a magnesium product and we didn't want to just do another me too magnesium. We wanted to do something special, which we have. So Wade, maybe we'll close off with your final thoughts on magnesium and your experiences. Yeah. So I went the, uh, I, I, of course I'm an all in kind of guy, as you imagined. And what I did is understanding when I was cooked and we talked about the magnesium thing is just so you know, different magnesiums affect different parts of the body. And we don't have time to go into all the details today, but you can learn more about that on the on magnesiumbreakthrough.com and, and the interactions between the different magnesium. Some are good for your brain, some are good for your heart, some are good for your skeletal muscle, some are good for your bones. Um, and that's why we have all the inclusions. But for me, I went to I went to uh, kind of using the old models that Linus Pauling and uh, these guys in orthomolecular nutrition is I go to the point where I overwhelm tolerance. And that means I, I dose up until I get the runs and then I c would come back. So when I was in deep in burnout, I went to six and a half grams before I got the runs. And that was in divided dosages. And, you know, I would take, I would take, I, st I started out at a, at a thousand at a time and then worked my way up. And then I would hit at six and a half grams. I'd just take them every couple of hours until I start getting the runs. <laughs> and then I dosed back down. And even today, uh, I'm still taking two, th two grams a day. Mm -hmm. um, and what I do notice if I, if I go to my favorite tea place, and I go to the black teas as opposed to say a poor, which a poor will have more theanine and a black tea will have less. Um, I, and I feel myself getting that kind of, uh, I'm getting revved up again. There's kind of a sense that I get. Uh, I come home and I extra, I add an extra gram of magnesium. And what's interesting is I don't get the disaster. Like I don't, I don't have to get the runs. So there's a, a definite correlation between my burnout effect or my stimulation effect and how much magnesium I can tolerate. And you kind of find your own balance. It's going to vary from person to person, but uh, that, that's how I do it. And, and that's what was one of the key factors in recovering as opposed uh, on, on top of adjusting my lifestyle and my expectations. As we'll be back uh, real soon with mm -hmm. another podcast about magnesium. It definitely warrants its entire, an entire episode on this. So anyways, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's always fun uh, chatting with you, Wade. It's always a blast. Yeah, it's always a blast. Great to have you back on the podcast. Uh, Matty G, co-founder of Bioptimizers. He's the guy that's often behind the scenes, but we're, we, we pulled him out of the out of control room here today. So I want to thank everybody, wherever you are, uh, make every day an awesome day. Jump into the 84 uh, Steps, the Awesome Health course. Look for the show links, of course, that uh, Matt identified so you can see what's causing the burnout in your life. But more importantly, uh, take time today to put that gratitude list. Get that heart and mind in the same level. It's an amazing practice, and I hope you enjoyed this. We'll hear your comments. If you like this, put a like, put a comment, share it with your friends. Look forward to hearing from you soon. Uh, from all of us at Bioptimizer, all of you, have yourself an awesome day. Bless, bless. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, rapid cheat meal relief. Research shows that cheat meals can actually be an effective way to boost your metabolism. One key weight loss hormone, leptin, can be increased by up to 30% following a cheat meal. The challenge with the cheat meals is that all those extra calories and lower food quality can be hard to digest, which means you could be totally sidelined with a food coma after big cheat meals. 
The solution is to take strong digestive enzymes like masszymes, which will help rapidly digest and break down the extra food. Three to five capsules before or right after your cheat meal can make a huge difference in how you feel following the cheat meal. If it's a cheat day with multiple large meals, you might want to go up to 10 capsules or higher to help you power through all that food. To save 10% on Masszymes, go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S dot com and enter the code CHEAT10 at checkout. 